Brothers, Namaste. Namaste in Hindi means I honor the place in you in which the entire universe dwells. I honor the place in you which is of love, of truth, of light, and of peace. When you are in that place in you, and I am in that place in me, we are one. Since we are one, let's share some thoughts today on, is this professionalism? It's a case, it's a true case, and whatever I say is from my personal knowledge of this case, I will not, of course, mention any names. And whilst we are speaking of synergies, it's time for reflection on synergies which can be negative. And this case, hopefully, will talk about a negative issue of synergy. And unless we know what's negative, we will not appreciate appreciate what is positive. So this, one can say, is a tale of two service providers to the insurance and shipping industries. This case is a factual one, relating to two insurance service providers. One, a marine insurance surveyor, appointed by the Highland Missionary Insurer of a floating dry dock, and the other, a risk management consultant, appointed by the owner of the floating dry dock in respect of a claim under the Hull and Missionary Policy. The question to be reflected upon is, what are the lessons we can learn from this case? So what we'd like to talk about is the issue of who these players are in this tale. We'll talk about the condition and valuation survey carried out by the surveyor. We'll talk about the policy of insurance and the express warranties therein. We'll talk about the towage approval by an expert as the marine warranty surveyor, who was none other than the same guy who did the condition and valuation survey. We'll also talk about towage approval by the flag administration of that country and the recognized organization. The whole issue revolves around the speed of tow and a slow speed penalty under BIMCO, BIMCO, BIMCO's TOCOM. So, how did all this start? Well, there was a problem about the opinion of the Marine Warranty Surveyor on the speed of tow, and very ironically, he put a speed limit of four knots, and the RO on behalf, the recognized organization on behalf of the flag state, put a speed limit of five knots. And the joke is that the flag administration of this country has made IMO 884 guidelines on towage, uh, towage on, on um, ocean towage as mandatory. And of course, I'm sure most of you know that uh, IMO 884 is, ex is totally silent on the speed of the tow, simply because, as we shall see during this presentation, the whole focus is not on the speed of the tow, but on the power of the tug for given environmental conditions. What happened was the forward platform of this floating dock fell off under tow. The vessel proceeded to a port of refuge where the marine warranty surveyor prevailed upon the owners to get him there. And once he was there, he got in touch with the Hallen missionary underwriter and promptly obtained his appointment as the surveyor on the damages. Now, in his new avatar, in his new, wearing a new hat as the damage surveyor, he recommends a second towage approval from the port of refuge. 
Eventually, it takes two years for him to issue his report. And then he says, this claim is not payable because there's a breach of warranty. And the speed specified, he uses the word imposed, very interestingly, imposed by me was four knots. And I don't care what flag state or the RO says about five knots. And therefore, this claim is not payable. That, this is the story. As I speak to you, the claim has not yet been paid. And eventually, I will end with a joint meeting which took place last Thursday. So this is as fresh as that. So let's look at these players. There was a shipyard owner who wanted to purchase a floating dry dock. So he went to his lawyer, and the lawyer made some inquiries and said that we must visit this insurance broker who perhaps will help us out as far as the insurance aspects of this floating dock is concerned. It was, for, it was to be towed from another country. And so they visit this insurance broker and the insurance broker promptly says, there's only one guy in this industry who is a marine expert and we should call him. And so promptly comes the marine expert. He has a discussion with them and says, the first thing you guys have to do is to do a condition and valuation survey, which I can happily do for you. And they said, fine. So they send him off to this place where he goes and inspects the floating dock and uh, says, well, here is the report. More importantly, he adds a towage approval in that report saying, this is my recommendation that you should do a towage approval. And he's doing this in a condition and valuation report. He was doing nothing else but hat tricks, wearing different hats. So now comes the Halland Missionary Underwriter, who receives the condition and valuation report of this expert, and then issues a policy stating that the condition and valuation survey and all the recommendations to be complied with by this expert. That's an express warranty. And he also puts, the underwriter puts a second warranty on towage approval before the vessel, uh, the dock is towed. So these are the express warranties in the policy. The broker did nothing about this. The owners did nothing about it. They just filed it. And then, before the towage starts, the expert recommends, not as a marine warranty surveyor, but as a friendly advice to the owners of the floating dock, you require to have a project consultant, and I recommend so-and-so as the project consultant. Synergy? We'll see. So here comes the condition and valuation survey. So the expert appointed by the floating dry dock owners for the condition and valuation survey, this appointment is by the owners of the floating dock. They pay for his trip. He goes there and reproduces in his thick report almost 95% of the floating dry dock specifications. Then he finds out what's the value that they are paying, and that's his valuation, and that's his condition and valuation survey report. No recommendations regarding anything other than saying, before this floating dock is moved, you should do a towage approval. Now, this comes in a condition and valuation survey. The photographs of the floating dock are attached, and clearly, there is a forward and aft platform. Some call it uh, apron. Some call it a working platform. And some call it a sponson. Now, strictly speaking, the word sponson from a naval architectural point of view is always an athwartship structure, never a fore and aft structure. However, since it was called a sponson, so be it. And so the forward platform was being strengthened. As I said, the report recommended towards approval prior to the departure. 
There were no adverse remarks on the condition of the floating dock, which mentions the forward platform of the sponsor. And the valuation was as per the price paid for the floating dock. So the condition valuation survey is report, issued. The insurer now looks at the condition and valuation report, and uh, the policy is on Institute Time Clause House 1083 with two amendments. Negligence of master officers and crew is deleted, and barratry of the master officers and crew are deleted. Other than that, the policy H is 1083, and by deleting this, it did not increase or decrease the coverage because a floating dock, as we all know, is unmanned. In the express warranty on towage, it was the name of this expert who was put there with no other option. So that is important to note as well. So this followed nothing but from the condition and valuation report where this expert nominated himself literally and the underwriters bowed their head to it. They also had a classification warranty and the floating die dock was classed with a member of the International Association of Classification Societies, so there was no issue as far as that was concerned. The insurers then, after issue of the policy, wrote to the assured that they would like to see and vet the towage agreement, which was unusual. However, the owner said, surely we are going to sign a to a token 2005, here is a copy. That was supposed to be scrutinized by the surveyor and the insurer. Neither of them came back. And eventually, the agreement was signed and a tug arranged for. In this particular policy, the names of the surveyors to be appointed in the event of a damage were not specified. In some policies they are, and in some policies they are not. And of course the policy was subject to English law and practice, because it was on Institute Time Clause House 1083 wordings. We now come to the next scene, the towage approval by this expert, who is now wearing the hat of the MWS, or the Marine Warranty Surveyor. So the owners now appoint the expert for the towage approval, and he goes there to see the floating dock and approve the tug tow and towing arrangements, which he does, he inspects it, and issues a towage approval certificate with certain notes. The towage certificate clearly says, the tug tow and towing arrangements were found satisfactory. He signs it, and on the second page says, note, and lists several of these notes, which we shall see at the end what these notes were, one of which was a speed restriction. The tow certificate com confirms that it's satisfactory, the speed limit of four knots, and other conditions imposed in the notes. No recommendation whatsoever to remove the forward or the aft platforms or aprons or sponsors. Now we have tow approval by the Flag State Administration, the RO. Owners comply with Flag State requirements for towage. The recognized organization, which is a member of the International Association of Classification Societies, approves the tow. The Flag State regulations make compliance with IMO 884, guidelines for ocean towage, mandatory in that particular country. Towage certificates make compliance with IMO 884 as a requirement. Interestingly, this particular RO on behalf of Flag State does not give a towage approval certificate. It gives a letter. And the letter says, this tow is permitted subject to compliance with IMO 884. IMO 884 from an international perspective is a guideline. It is not mandatory, but this particular flag state has made it mandatory. There is no mention in this 
document of any speed restriction. This then comes the five knot speed restriction in the towed certificate by flag state and RO. No recommendations by this RO to remove the forward and aft platforms or apron, although their own classification rules on floating dry docks mandates that prior to approval of the tow, the forward and aft platforms are to be necessarily removed. Now we come into the tow being, the tow is commenced. The proposed tow agreement on TOCON 2008, I, it, there's a mistake here, it is 2005, <coughs> was sent to the insurers. No response from either the insurers or the surveyors. They signed TOCON 2005 with the tug owners. The tow commences. And the master finds himself constrained by this tow not speed in the MWS approval. The weather is fine, he can go at greater than four knots, but he does not. And then ask the owner, please let me know whether you want me to stick to the four knot restriction or go up to five knots as per your flag state recommendation. If you insist that I go at four knots, then in accordance with the token, I'm going to charge you slow steaming which means you've got to pay for me to comply with this four knots. So what the owners do, they refer the matter to the MWS. Insurers, for whatever reason, were not kept advised of this communication. So extracts from TOCON, there is clause 24 which says necessary deviation or slow steaming. And according to this clause, Again, my mistake, this 2008 and not 2005, I was, I, I'm confused, my, my apologies. So, it says that for several reasons, if the master feels that he has to necessarily slow down, then he slows down. But here, he says that I can go more than four knots, but there is a restriction. So, the opinion of the MWS is sought on the speed of the tour. And very interestingly, he says, the master is to take a decision on the speed of the tow. He also says, the tow speed is to be safe, no strain on the towing gear. And further says, since the RO has permitted five knots, master to take a decision. Who's this? The same guy who said four knots restriction. And last but not least comes, comes this punchline which says, under maritime law, the master is the authority. As a marine warranty surveyor, he is mentioning this. Tow speed thereafter during the tow was increased but never exceeded 4.9 knots. No further incident until the tow encounters heavy weather after about 20 days. After about 20 days, the weather deteriorates. Force, not 8 or 9, but just force 4 5. Tugmaster notices that the floating dry dock is down by the bow. So she's trimming down. Further observation indicates that the forward platform, apron, or sponson is no longer there. It's fallen off. The tugmaster informs the owners of the floating dock. The tugmaster then proceeds to a port of refuge some 100 nautical miles away, which was closer than uh, uh, to, the, to any port on the country where the floating dock had to eventually go to. The master now reduces tow speed and no further incident till arrival at the port of refuge. Now these daily reports were going to the marine warranty surveyor and he prevails upon the owners of the floating dock to make arrangements for him to proceed to the port of refuge along with the project consultant and the owner's representative. Unfortunately, this owner did not have either a marine superintendent or an engineer superintendent. So the person who went was a commercial person, but the project consultant was an ex-seafarer, so he was the knowledgeable guy there. 
and incidentally he had recently resigned from the same RO or the class which was approved by the flag state. So it was assumed that he would know what to do. So the vice president of the floating dock, the project consultant and the marine warranty surveyor proceed to the port of refuge. Due to heavy weather in the port of refuge, the marine warranty surveyor and others cannot board the floating dock. The marine warranty surveyor, because that's what his role is at this point of time, observes that the forward platform is missing. The forward bulkhead right in front where the platform was joined is severely damaged, plates torn open, and watertight integrity of the forward platform is impaired because that's why it made her down by the bow, but she had enough of watertight subdivision. The marine warranty surveyor now telephones the insurer and gets his appointment as the damage surveyor. So he goes there by prevailing upon the, he goes there prevailing on the owners to take him and now he is wearing a new hat. The insurers do not inform the floating dry dock owners of the surveyor's appointment and the surveyor at that port of refuge issues instructions to the floating dock owners on loss minimization in his new, wearing his new hat as the damage surveyor and says now you go to the second port of refuge in where eventually the country where you have to take it to go there to one of those port of refuges. Very, very interestingly, the surveyor's letter to the floating dry dock owners is signed by the project consultant of the floating dry dock. All of this is on record. The surveyor opines now that the tug master was grossly negligent and orders arrest of the tug. This is a new avatar. Maritime lawyer, <clears throat> grossly negligent. Incidentally, this guy has never been on board a tug in his career. He has no idea of what navigation is all about or what towing is, and yet he sits in judgment on the tug master saying grossly negligent. So, we now have the damage uh, surveyor recommend the second towage approval from the second port of refuge. So this is how he gets into his second role as a marine warranty surveyor. Now, as a damage surveyor, he says, before you leave, you have to do a, uh, an approval of this tug. And the underwriters promptly issue an endorsement saying he will do the marine warranty survey. Insurance brokers inform the floating dry dock owners to follow the instructions of the surveyors. Surveyor appointed by floating dry dock owners for the second towage approval. The second towage approval is stereotyped, very similar to the first one. Surveyor recommends floating dock owners to arrest the tug and contact a maritime advocate in that country where this vessel is to go. So, the damage surveyor now takes several documents from the floating dock owners in his capacity as damage surveyor. The owners take time to prepare a claim, which is in the region of a million dollars. The damage surveyor approves a hundred thousand dollars as fair and reasonable and says, there's a breach of towage warranty because the tow speed exceeded four knots. The uh, owners state that the cause of the incident is a pedal of the seas, which is disputed by the surveyor, and claims unsettled since the past three years. So this is the issue of the report after two years. Extracts from the towage approval certificate. Tow to depart during daylight hours and tow speed not to exceed four knots during the voyage. Sufficient stability of the tow is to be maintained at all times. This particular marine warranty surveyor has given two pieces of paper as the towage approval certificate. No report whatsoever 
on the actual towage approval survey that he conducted. No stability was calculated. No longitudinal strength was calculated. The third recommendation, all loose gears in the tow are to be securely lashed, which means either he saw them or he didn't see them. All access openings through which water may ingress into the interior of the tow are to be closed watertight. Now, there are only manholes on the main deck, and he should have seen them, that they are closed or not. The draft marks on the tow should be monitored frequently from the tug, interesting, to confirm that the tow is not shipping water. So I don't know how the tug master is going to find out what the draft aft and midships were. <laughs> Even if he tried to read the drafts forward, because there were no draft marks forward, they were on the side. All parts of the towing arrangements are to be a as per approved towage plan. And this marine warranty survey has not given a towage, war, a, a towage plan at all, neither an approved one. Now comes this. All statutory, mandatory permissions, approval from concerned agencies are to be obtained and held prior to commencement of the tow. And in case of delay to tow beyond 48 hours, a fresh certificate is to be issued so that he can charge another 1,000 US dollars or whatever his rate is, because every certificate you issue has a price to it. Now, the assurance appointed a consultant, and he said, let's have a transparent meeting where we will get to know what's the problem. And so last Thursday evening at 5 o'clock, this meeting was held in the insurer's office. One day prior to the meeting, the risk management consultants asked the owner, have you informed them of who's attending this meeting? And uh, there were three who were going to attend, the, finance man uh, the general manager of finance of the floating dry dock company, a uh, lawyer, and this consultant. And the lawyer said, why do we have to tell them this? And the consultant said, I feel it is professionally correct to inform them rather than give them surprises. And so when they were informed, the insurance company said, nothing doing, not that consultant, because we don't want him here. And the floating dock owner said, thank you very much. There won't be a meeting because if we don't bring someone who we rely on, there's no point in having a meeting. Very reluctantly, the meeting was held. And no sooner it started, this expert, this marine warranty surveyor, this damage surveyor, this maritime expert, starts hurling abuses at the consultant and the assured, curses them and says, come to court in a totally unprofessional manner. And the insurers watch this helplessly, not saying a word. This is what happened. Now, in that meeting, this risk management consultant kept his cool, acted professionally, and said, there's only one question I want to ask all of you, what is the proximate cause of this loss? And gave them copies of this diagram, which shows the floating dry dock in the plan view, the Smith towing pads, the forward apron or sponson in its place, the chain bridle, the fish plate, the pendant, the tow rope, and the tug. And this was the elevation, which shows clearly that the bridle chain was actually on top of that of the flat of the forward platform, which is a cantilevered structure. And every time there was this roll, pitch, heave, sway, whatever motions were there, this was coming bang on, as shown in this in this next picture, and a copy of the ROs 
class rules for floating dry docks was shown and that clearly says the if the uh, in addition the following will be required for issuance of a towed certificate this aprons or working platforms are to be removed from the ends of a dock prior to an ocean tow so what really happened there was blissful ignorance and blissful ignorance led to this the marine warranty surveyor may or may not have realized his mistake but very cleverly got himself to the port of refuge got himself to advise to arrest the tug got himself to say gross negligence and the irony of all of this is there is a knock for knock agreement in the token which means if the master of the tug was negligent there is a hold harmless agreement against it between the tug owner and the barge owner the insurers turned a nelson's eye to all of this including the fact that the project manager signed the surveyor's letter and the ship owners also had no way of knowing how this happened and did not want to take that matter further so the risk management consultant should he walk away from this Brother Millen sent me this clip just uh, three days ago, and uh, I want to thank him for it. And I thought I'll reproduce it here. Robert Chu says, "Walking away has nothing to do with weakness, and everything to do with strength. We walk away not because we want others to realize our worth and value, but because we finally realize our own. If we don't have self-esteem, we don't have self-confidence in ourselves." then we have nothing thank you very much thank you I'd like now to take questions from yeah. here because i'm sure this is a topic which has opened all our eyes to a different form of synergy if we may say so delegate you keep reserve your questions we have a question and answer session in the afternoon Around okay. 16:45 to 17:15. Okay, so no questions now. No, okay. no there is no questions. Okay, fair enough. On behalf of IAMS India branch, we shall we request Mr. B K Patacharya to come to the dais and give momento to the speaker.